Welcome to the Best Business Podcast, the podcast for established marketers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs, the ones who want to join me in my mission to create 200 new multimillionaires who solve world problems with entrepreneurship. If that's you, then this podcast was created to give you access to the tools, training, strategies, and tactics you need to achieve multiple seven-figure profits as soon as possible. This world needs the best business you can build, so please get ready, open your mind, believe you can do this, and let's build a better world together for future generations. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Daryl Urbanski, your fearless leader, and today I've got a great guest for us today and friend. Uh, We're joined today by Carl Taylor, and Carl is my brother from the land down under. He is the author of the number one new and notable business book, Red Means Go, and he's also the founder of the Business Builders Academy. Carl first started his business career when he was 15, and now with 13 years in business and three successful exits, he teaches new and existing entrepreneurs how to save time and money by buying, building, and selling businesses. He was also named in the top 10 Young and Influential Awards and was nominated two years in a row for the top 30 Entrepreneurs Under 30 Awards by Ant Hill Magazine. He's also just really easy to talk to, has a great personality, is eager to help, Um, and I'm proud and honored to be able to turn to him when I have questions. So, Carl, thank you so much for your time today. I know you've got a busy schedule. Uh, How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, thanks, Daryl. Thanks for having me. And uh, I feel like after that intro, you know, my my work here is done. I can... can... (laughs) Ah, It's a wrap on the day. (laughs) That's awesome, man. So, um, I guess to kind of get started, I mean... Tell us, that's, I think a lot of people that probably piqued their interest, it's always really interesting when you hear someone so young at such a young age, age getting involved in business, how did you get started in this? Like at 15, what was what was going on? Yeah, look, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of introspection, I suppose, over the years now. Uh, I'm, I'm 28 now and, it, you know, I, I think what really happened is I was bullied as a kid. I was a very shy, introverted kid and a lot of people wouldn't know that about me anymore, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, I was very shy and introverted. I, I wouldn't. I was that kid in the class that even if I knew the answer, I wouldn't raise my hand because I didn't want to draw attention to myself. And um, you know, I was bullied. And I think what ultimately happened is because I'm, I'm not a very well built guy. Uh, you know, even today I'm still not exactly. Uh, you know, someone who could who could you know look very threatening or intimidating, but. Uh, you know, I realized that there was no point in trying to fight these people back um, because I would fail. So in my mind, I suppose, well, I figured I'm smarter than them. One day I will own you. That was kind of my mentality back then. Is, oh, I, I will own you one day. That will be my way of getting back at you. And, um, you know, over, over the time I have gotten over that ego driven thing, but it was really an ego thing that, that got me started and kick started. And, um, I, I borrowed money from my grandmother to start this very first business. I was going to, this is very early days. Google wasn't the search engine it is today. I was going to create an online costume shop. Well, I did create an online costume shop where people could hire or buy costumes. And being in Australia, um, you know, the internet was extremely new mm. and uh, people weren't buying things online. And so I borrowed money from my grandmother and I started searching. I think I used Metacrawler back then, the search engine. <laughs> And uh, I, know that. I, I found I found this this company over in the states uh, that had a Darth Maul costume, and uh, from from Star Wars. And so I, I I bought that, brought it into Australia, and I took it to school because being fifteen, who do you think I thought right. my mother was? Right, I, I knew nothing about business, just that you know this sounded like a good idea. Right, and um, <laughs> I. I brought this costume in, showed it to all my friends. People thought it was cool, but not a single person either had the money or was interested in buying or renting this costume. So I, I learned a very quick lesson in business that, you know, without customers, you have no business. Mm. Um, and, and But, I, you know, my, my grandmother was very supportive. Um, you know, she always, she helped me learn about managing money. Uh, she lent me my first, uh, I, she was my first loan to be able to buy my first computer and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and she was supportive to be able to lend me that money for, to start that business. But that business failed. But I, doing that, I had to start and I taught myself HTML and, and programming to build a website. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, at school I was doing my – there was a course called Business Studies, which, you know, in hindsight was pretty useless from a business point of view. But it got me at least – we had to do a, a business plan. And I did the business plan for – for the, the costume shop. And that really got me thinking and starting to think about business a lot more. 
and I was working part time at a pizza shop, and uh, this guy came in one day, um, and he was he, he had a business, pretty successful business actually, just next door, and he came in one day, and I don't remember how it started, but he basically bottom line said, I need to build a new website. Do you know anyone? And I don't really know why he asked me, mm-hmm. um, and I. I don't know why I answered, I think I could help you with that. Uh, but that was the moment when my first official real business that actually made some money mm-hmm. started, which was doing web design and web development for people. Wow. And um, that was really the start for me. And, and from there, again, I still knew nothing about business. I think I, I wrote, read my first ever businessy finance book uh, by an Australian guy called Roy, Roy McDonald. And... Um, it was called How to Turn a Dollar into into a Million Dollars in Seven Years or Less. And uh, that was the first ever book I ever really read on on finance and things. So at that point, I did, still didn't know much about business. And uh, I just kind of fumbled my way through, managed to pick up a few more clients, built a website, got some hosting clients. I had people from around the world. Um, and I wasn't making a, lo- a ton of money, but I was making an okay money while still at high school. Right. And, and um, Making any money when you're in high school is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was great. I mean, it was I was still working at the pizza shop. That was really what was giving me my my cash flow. But you know, when I wasn't there, or I wasn't studying for my my school certificate, and then eventually HSC, which was like our end of year for high school stuff. Um, you know, it it was late nights, early mornings, uh, working away on on either my own projects or clients' websites, and I was just sitting in front of the computer. Really, and, that's and, awesome. Uh, Even at such a young age, to just have that discipline, because I mean, yeah. I've I've tried to hire like twenty year olds, thirty year olds that have a hard time just showing up um, uh, to work on time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, well, again, I mean, you know, for me, I, I was still that shy, introverted kid. Yeah, I had friends, and I, I, you know, would hang out with my friends, but really, you know, I still just when I was hanging out with them, we were usually playing like video games or something like that. Like we were probably the geeky bunch, right? Right. And um, yeah, I just would spend so much time in front of the computer and and that was kind of my life. I knew it really well. I was good at it and I didn't, the thing I liked most about it is I didn't have to interact with people. Mm. Um, And yeah, eventually I finished high school and at the end of that point kind of had that crisis of, well, who am I? What do I really want? Um, and so I went, you know what, this business thing's good, but it hasn't really paid that well. Uh, I think I'm going to get out of the business, you know, and I don't know where along the line I thought of this, but I decided I was going to sell the business, not just kind of shut it down. And I went and contacted a whole bunch of competitors and suppliers and said, hey, look, I'm looking to sell my business. And this uh, one of my competitors said, hey, yeah, I'd be interested. And I managed to sell that business very first time, knew nothing about negotiations, knew nothing about valuing a company. And so I basically said, hey, well, what do you want to offer me for it? And the guy goes, uh, I'll give you $400. And again, not knowing anything about negotiations, but I'd seen enough TV to know that you should at least counter offer something, right? So I went back and said, I'll make it 600 And the deal was done. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, the dodgiest thing ever. Uh, yeah, but that's awesome. How old were you? Uh, at this point, I was 18. Okay, that's awesome. That's still awesome. That's really awesome. Got it. So therefore, so, you built and sold your first company. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, it, you know, I kick myself now when I know what the company was actually worth. It was worth about six and a half grand, which you know is still not a massive amount, but the difference there is like ah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, it's 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 was a great learning, and it really just freed. You know, it freed me to kind of go, okay, what am I going to do now? And then I had my I went off and tried all sorts of different things, Um, did an apprenticeship, did a whole bunch of stuff, was in these multi-million dollar mansions doing, you know, home automation for people. And that was amazing, but I realized I didn't want to be installing that stuff. I wanted that. So I went to go get back into business and I bought into an IT support business with my father. Um, And uh, from there, we took it from being a home-based business to Having you know five full time staff, growing it from working with home users to having um, you know bi- businesses and having support plans and what's known as a managed service provider. So that was really my test business for over eight years. Ran that business, tried numerous things, made money, lost money. Some ideas worked amazingly well, others didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was that business that really set me off because we got our first business coach, 
And the business coach introduced me to the world of books, learning from other people, uh, finding others who had done what you wanted to do and, and finding out what they did and, and replicating that, modeling that. Um, and that's really when everything took off for me and a lot of things changed in my mindset. Uh, I started to grow and push my comfort zone and become not that shy, introverted kid anymore. Yeah, because I was surprised to hear you say that because, I mean, you've been on stages and lots of public speaking. And so, yeah. I mean, obviously, like, you, you know, all of us are nervous when we first get into that, but it's just through persistence and practice that we overcome it. But I, anyways, I was just surprised. Cause well, they, just, they say, actually, that it's um, most of the best public speakers and or, or seminar leaders are actually introverts uh, at heart, um, which was really interesting when I read that because I was like, oh, okay. Well, that makes sense to me because it's that whole – one of my mentors, he had this quote that hard work will always beat talent when talent refuses to work hard. And I think that when you're nervous or introverted in that respect, you actually put time and attention to, to do, quote, unquote, silly things to actually, you know, get – like public, you know, like to join Toastmasters and get training on it. Whereas if you're really comfortable with it, you're just going to, you know, like, you, oh, I got this. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, that arrogance true. of knowing. So True, very true. Got it. Yeah, so that's kind of been my, my journey. And then, you know, so while I had the IT business, I, um, I bought another business doing gift baskets. Uh, so it was an online, well, it wasn't online when I bought it and I took it online doing like e-commerce selling and we were selling to a lot of real estate agents. Uh, so when someone sell a house, there would then be a gift basket sent to the person who sold the house as well as someone who bought the house. And uh, and that was a great little business that I bought with the whole purpose to build and sell, which I then uh, sold 18 months later and, and made a tidy, tidy little profit on that. Nice. Uh, and then in 2011, I sold the IT business as well because I'd written my book and I'd kind of gotten over doing IT and realized that I wanted to inspire others and, and really help people grow in the same way that business has allowed me to grow as a person. And uh, I truly believe that, you know, business is, I, I'm a big believer in personal development and I truly believe that the best personal development course you can ever go on is to have your own business. Yes. Oh, yes. I've talked about this in other interviews, but I think it's so true. I think business is so Shakespearean where often you fall victim to your flaws. Yes. Um, yeah, it's so, yeah, you, you have to become really well-rounded. You have to, most people can barely manage their own personal finances, let alone a business and their personal finances, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, yeah, I, hands down, I think if you want to become a better person, more well-rounded and have less struggle in your life, it's, it's almost like that, it's that catch-22, you know, if you want to get up and go and slave at the gym a couple times a week, it'll be easier for you to, you know what I mean, to have mobility in your old age. But if you take the easy route in the beginning, it might be harder on you in the end. So I think it's the same sort of thing. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. So that's awesome. So what, when, you know, you had, those are really different industries you've been in. And I know a lot of people, they often, I often hear, you know, well, my business is different. And I just want to say, like, what were some of the challenges that you had? And, and you know, are there transferable skills? How intricate is one business versus another? Um, if that's even a, 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 well, yeah, that's what I want to ask. Yeah. So I'm going to ask it. Oh, it's a, <laughs> no, it's a great question. And I mean, I get that too in, in Business Builds Academy. You know, a lot of people, when I talk about buying a business, they go, oh, well, what business should I buy? And I go, well, it probably doesn't really matter. Because business is business. Mm -hmm. um, the same, it's like uh, a mentor of mine once used to use the analogy of a car. You know, the, the chassis might be different, but the in, insides uh, mm -hmm. of how the car actually works is exactly the same. Right. And, right. and that's so true with business. You know, <clears throat> every business, especially in the online space, right, has to get traffic or eyeballs, right? You've got to get people to see your stuff. Mm -hmm. You've then got to get people to either walk in the door or opt in if it's a website um, that, you know, they've got to kind of take that first micro commitment step to at least start to have a conversation, whether it's online or offline. And, and, and then once you've got them, you've got to be able to convert them into a customer and get them to buy something. And once you've got them to buy something, you've got to get them to spend more money and then get them to come back again and again. Mm -hmm. And then you've got profit margins as well. You know, you've got your costs and you've got your profit margins and your pricing. So the, the fundamentals of every business is exactly the same. Right. It's, it's, it's just the tactic that you might use, the market, you know, a marketing strategy that works in one business maybe won't work in another. But then sometimes some of the best things you can learn is go and find an industry or a business that's doing something in an industry completely different to yours and take that same strategy and put it into yours because that means no one else is doing it 
and um, it's going to kind of disrupt the market. And if they've proven it works, I mean, it, to give you an example in the gift basket business, one of the things, I don't know if you guys had it over, over there, but we had um, this big thing going on with prepaid mobile phones. You call them cell phones. Um, prepaid mobile phones where, you know, you, you'd buy the prepaid credit and you could then, um, you know, make your phone calls and, if, and then you could just top up automatically. And so I took that same concept and I installed that into the gift baskets so people could mm. prepay um, to get these gift baskets and it would auto top up so they could go, you know, if you give us $500, that'll actually get you $700 worth of gifts if you prepay. Um, and, you know, when it gets down to this value, we'll then pre-top up again to your existing amount. Right. Um, and so I just, I looked at another industry, saw that and went, you know, I reckon that would work well. Which is so brilliant because that's like, first of all, that's a brilliant strategy because um, gift cards, I heard something crazy like only 50% or 40% of gift cards are ever redeemed or some crazy stat, maybe I have it inverse, but it's like 70% then. But still, like with gift cards, that's such a great idea because people are prepaying. So you already have the money. Cash flow is not a problem. You're not buying inventory. You're getting cash up front first. I just, that's just a great model. I love that. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So absolutely. Business is business is business. Uh, I do believe, you know, that you should find something that you at least, if you don't know a lot about that business, you need to at least find that jockey. You need to find someone who does know a lot about that business to be a part of the business. Um, but the fundamentals for any, you know, you can go into any business once you understand how it works. Right, right. So what have been some of the biggest challenges for you in business in general among the different industries and now buying and selling businesses and coaching others through doing the same? What are some of the biggest challenges that you, you've kind of seen people come up against? I think the biggest challenge, you know, and this is speaking for me personally, the biggest challenge that I've ever faced and continue to face to this day, and I think it faces a lot of people, is belief and mindset. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of money on personal development courses and training. Uh, I spent a lot of time on all of that. And even still, I struggle day to day with all sorts of, you know, belief in myself, you know, what right do I have to to teach people this stuff? What right do I have to do this? Or, you know, you're going to enter into a new market or for me, you know, now I might be creating a new product and I'll go, well, someone else has already created a really good product in that market. Why should I bother creating one? And 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 while logically I know that that's just not right, it's it's something that I've personally struggled with a lot. And in one of, on one of my masterminds with um, some friends of mine who we, we get together every week and have a mastermind, we... I discovered, I used to think this was just me, and then we had a conversation once and realized that every single one of us, and we're all very quite, you know, some would say we're very successful in our different things. Um, it was very interesting to realize that that never really seems to go away, at least what I've discovered is, you know, the more, if anything, even the more successful, unquote, that you become, um, probably the harder it gets because, you know, look, yeah, I've done some amazing things for my age. I've packed a lot in. Um, but to be honest, a lot of my biggest successes happened between 15 and 24. I'm now 28. If I look at the last four years and go, hey, Carl, what have I done? I will question myself and go, well, nowhere near as much as pe people probably expected me to do because you put this and it's completely self put on. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. But I put this pressure on myself to think, well, I've got to keep succeeding. And, and one of the big myths out there for everyone listening, one of the big myths in business is you think, just because you've been successful once means you'll continue to be successful. And mm. it's sadly, it's it's not the case. I wish it was. Yeah, no. uh, I've had plenty of like more success. failures. Yeah, I've had plenty more failures uh, after some of my successes. Uh, but then I have, you know, little micro su successes and have some other successes too. So it, the biggest challenge, I think, that it, we as entrepreneurs, and especially those in my audience and maybe some of yours too, who really aspire and are passionate about business, which I know you and I are, and you know, really see that as their the rest of their life. And that's who my audience is. They're the people who they're passionate about business. They see that this is how they can change the world. This is how they can achieve their dream. This is this is them. Uh, I think you you when you truly become that serial entrepreneur, it's no longer a, I do business. It's like I am business. This is like my life. Mm. Um, and I think the biggest challenge that we face, those types of people face, is is realizing the the ongoing struggle in your head of you know, what right do I have to do this? Do I believe in this? Uh, you know, who else believes in me? Do I believe in myself enough or is there other people around me 
um, you know, and, and looking sadly as it is, some of that validation from other people that you're on the right track. And um, yeah, that's something that's probably struggled for me, and I see some of my clients struggling with that as well. No, I, I can relate to that as well. Recently, I had a promotion that I was doing where I was going to be, um, well, I was going to do a promotion, and I wanted to use some of my like a recent campaign I done for a client. We generated literally millions of dollars, and I wanted to tout to that. But it was one of those client deals that didn't end very well, and I found myself procrastinating and avoiding it to the point that even my team was like, what's up, Daryl? And I was totally unaware that I was even doing it. I was just prioritizing client work and, oh, this is a priority. And one of my assistant actually was like, Daryl, is there a reason why this has been on your list for three days in a row, four days in a row? Um, you, you just won't do it? And I was like, I don't know. And then I had to dig down and realize, well, it's you. this comes up because what you said, looking for outside validation. And it was because the relationship hadn't ended well. I was looking to... Like, you know, I'm about to tout my, my accolades for what I'd accomplished in this promotion I was going to be doing. But then it was like the, the external evidence I wanted. It was like if I actually accomplished that, how could the relationship have ended in any other way other than a handshake, a pat on the back, and, you know, and the money that I was due. But because it didn't, it was like exactly like you said, that self-doubt. But the reality is, is I've got tons of clients, and that's only one client. And yeah. um, exactly like you said, it's just such a mindset thing, and it's it's – I, full, I fully agree with you there. I would see when I had my martial arts school, I would see people lose matches at tournaments before it even started. You, you yeah. just see it in their body language. They get up against another guy and they would just, it would, they would just kind of like, you just see their, their body like kind of crumple. Like, you know, they just become a little deflated. You could just visibly see like one guy kind of get, his posture would improve and the other guy would kind of flinch a little bit. And I remember training with one of my mentors um, at his school First of all, I remember once he came he came across the the mat like mad. Daryl, wipe that look off your face because I was like tired, I was gassed, and I guess it was I was showing it on my face. And he was so mad at me. He came over and was like, "Don't you ever like you just like you just, like scared me, right?" But I was like, "Okay, yeah. don't don't show weakness." But then even the rest in between, we were doing these training exercises, and then in minutes in between, like one minute break, two minute break, your partner that you were training with, you would just stare them down for the like minute, two minute, and you would feel yourself getting like like emotional. Like getting stared at, like you get angrier. You, you know, like you, it was just a weird thing, but it's just, it's a psychological. It's exactly like you said, just psyching yourself out for things that are imaginary. It's, what is it, uh, fear? It's, it's false evidence appearing real or something like yeah. that. I, I use the acronym, I have two acronyms for fear it's false expectations appearing real and then finding excuses and reasons. Mm. Yeah. So you've got false expectations that appear real and then you find excuses and reasons to avoid it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a great Jim, uh, Jim, I love Jim Rohn. I love quotes. There's a great Jim Rohn quote that I just posted the other day, and it was, hold on, it was, um, where is it here? If you really want to do something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. And Jim yeah. Rohn, I love that. Do you have any good quotes? Yeah, uh, I think one of my favorite quotes is, you know, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right, which is almost, you know, it's kind thing. of the same. Yeah, yeah, but it's... <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite quotes, it's something I always think about when, when I'm talking with people or myself, it's like, you know, if I think I can, I can. If I think I can't, I can't, you know, because I'll give up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Another one that I love is from Tony Robbins about you meet your musts. Um, I often will repeat that to myself. It's you'll meet your musts. And I've seen that in my business life and personal life time and time again. It's when something's a must, you find a way. Uh, you know, those times when the bank account's almost empty and you're like, if I don't make a sale or get something happening this week, you know, I won't eat. It becomes a must right. and you make right. it happen. And then those times when it's like, oh, you know, there's plenty of cash in the bank. Don't need to really do something. I'd like to. Right. right. <laughs> you, you don't seem to do it, you know? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, again, that's, that's success. nothing fails like success. You, you've, yep. got, you've had a really good quarter or two, and suddenly you go on vacation, but when you come back, the vacation didn't really end. Um, I, know, I know that all too well. That's awesome. <laughs> that's so awesome. So um, what do you recommend to people who are starting out or struggling and they're trying to get into a business or they're trying to start a business or you know, they have a business and they're, they want to, you know, they have this extra capital they want to reinvest? What do you recommend to someone who's just getting started or struggling? Yep. Yeah, like I mean, if, I'm a big believer in leverage, um, and so one of the best leverage and kind of why I, you know, one of the fundamentals of things I teach is rather than starting a business 
um, you can buy an established business that already has cash flow, already potentially has staff, vendor relationships, a whole bunch of the hard work already done for you. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually buy that business uh, either with no money at all or none of your own money uh, or at least, you know, cheaper than someone's asking. So if someone's asking a million dollars for their business, you know, you could potentially get in there and buy it for 500000 or, you know, you can go smaller than that. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been able to negotiate businesses down to as little as $1. And when people hear that, they think, oh, $1, it's not possible. Um, and, and the thing is, it, it is. And it's happened in the big end of town and small end of town for decades. Um, I think over in the States, for memory, TV Guide, the company TV Guide, sold for a dollar. Uh, here in Australia, there was a uh, – actually, I think they went to, to the US and I'm not sure about Canada as well, but they had um, – there was ABC Learning Centres, which was a childcare um, business, and it grew too fast, and they ended up having to sell off a bunch of their of their, their centres. And so um, a, a charity here in Australia was able to buy nine fully kitted out with students enrolled uh, childcare centres for a dollar each. So $9, and they had nine businesses – up and running that was already producing cash. Now, so, is that like an earnout? Like, how how do you do that? Is that where you buy it for a dollar and then you pay the owner as you know over time as the business validates itself? Is that it's that possible? Sort of- that is that's what you know in in Australia we call that vendor finance. Uh, I think over on your side of the pond, it's it's seller financing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can and, and the earnout like that is one strategy. When I'm talking about one dollar here, though, I'm talking about it was one dollar. And the reason for the dollar is because it was really you're saying the business is worthless to me, um, and the dollar is just to allow a legal transaction to occur and, and transfer of assets. So you, you, you're kind of basically going, you know what? These people are saying I want out, and it can be for a number of different reasons. Um, now, you know, seller financing, vendor financing is another great strategy that you can use. Uh, so you're essentially using the person who's selling the business's money to buy their business from them over time from the cash flow of the business. Um, there are, you know, now with crowdfunding, there's all, all sorts of opportunities there to raise cash. Um, I, I'm not a big believer in needing to go to the bank because at least post GFC, uh, you know, getting cash from the bank has always has been harder is what people uh, always tell me. So you know, using, I'd rather see people sort of, you know, there's people listening who are going, I've got a bunch of cash and I want to get into a business. I would rather you go, that cash is my working capital. That's the money I'm going to use to grow the business and look at how can you get into a business using a very small portion of that or none of it at all and uh, and get in the business. Because that's one of the things that I, when I used to run my seminars about how to buy a business for a dollar, I'd get a lot of people who'd show up that had a dollar to their name. And the, the challenge is, yes, you can buy businesses for a dollar. It happens all the time. But it's not like going to a supermarket and saying, I'll take that one. It's only a dollar. Um, it takes time. It takes, um, you know, checking. And usually the reason it's selling for a dollar is there is an issue. So if you don't have working capital to be able to, um, you know, ramp it up or you don't have the skills, like if it's your very first business at all, I would not be looking for a one dollar deal uh, unless you've got someone you're partnered with who knows what they're doing because you're you're likely, you know, going to go backwards. Um, but if you can buy a business that was asking a hundred grand and you got it for fifty grand, uh, or even, you know, and maybe 50, maybe it was only ten grand down, that's pretty good. So that's what I would say is if if you're looking to get into a business, look at how you can leverage other people's time, money and resources. And if someone's had a business for five years and you buy it at that point, you just saved yourself five years of blood, sweat, and tears yep. that it took to figure all that out, put it all together, get the clients that they got, uh, build the systems if, if they even have systems, the relationships. Um, you can save yourself a lot of that and you can buy it at a massive discount. Um, so, yeah, that's that's probably where I would say to start. And if for those that are already in a business going, well, I don't want to do that, look, buying a business can be a great way to expand your business and grow quickly. But the next thing I'd say really is about figure out your why. It's going back to Tony Robbins' quote about you meet your musts. Um, when you truly, and I, I thought I knew my why for a long time. I always thought very um, logically about it. Mm-hmm. And I realized it's not a lot, your why is not a logical thing at all. It's, it's emotional. And when you truly find it and, you know, uh, it changes at times as well. But when you f- truly find it, you just, everything becomes a huge must 
Um, you're truly just are connected and in flow and nothing will distract you. When you logically go, I mean, I used to think, oh, my why is to change the world. And that sounds nice on paper and it sounds really cool, but it didn't drive me. Yep. Um, it didn't. It was very surface level, very logical, what I thought people, it, what, what I thought it should be, not what it really was. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that's such a good point. I'm reading, I'm, I'm always reading a handful of books at a time, but there's one book I'm reading of the five I have going right now called The Chimp Paradox. And, he t and in it, he's talking about how we've got three brains. We've got our human brain, which is the logical, rational self. We've got, uh, and he uses, he, 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 uh, he acknowledges that this is an overgross generalization, but he, uh, the human brain, the logical, rational one, the computer that's breathing, your heartbeat, all these automatic functions, and then your chimp brain. And your chimp brain is like the 800-pound gorilla in your body and in your life. It's the one that, you know, you think like – it's like as a marketer, I'm just always like baffled by the huge gap between people, what people say – what they think and when then what they actually do and a lot of that is the chimp and so that's what like your emotional your rational your passion your wants your desires and so that feeling part of you and that's exactly i think that's what you're talking about there like you you need that deeper why because you have to it's such a powerful resource if you're just operating with your computer and your human brain i mean that's 20 percent where the 80 percent of your brain really is what you want you feel like your feelings your emotions your gut and that if you can get that lined up behind something um, again they talk about mothers that have been able to lift a burning car um, or lift a car just to save a child and things like that like you know they could never do any other way it's because they just they encompass their their being in it and that's that's those principles from think and grow rich um, really? yeah so i that's that's a great tip to, i just mentioned a couple of books there the was it the chimp paradox and think and grow rich They're, those are two two books i'd recommend for anyone that um, is looking to, to, pr to further their education um, what would you recommend? What are some of the books that you would? Well, uh, my own, of course, Red Means Go. Of course. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, no, it, I mean, look, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's a, uh, people tell me it's a great, great little book and I, you know, I, I think it's pretty good. Um, and you know, I'd recommend that, but what probably one of my favorite books actually is called The Ultimate Gift by Jim Stovall. Have you, have you heard of that one? So this book's great in that it really helps you appreciate that the gift is in the journey and, you know, mm. you know, necessarily the destination. Very similar if you've read The Richest Man in Babylon, kind of very similar message, um, but it's, got a, it's a great story um, that really connects you with this guy. Um, and I really, I really just really liked it. It, it really, I suppose this, this whole call, it feels like we're going very, uh, you know, uh, mental and, and, and psychological and, and personal development, -y, but it, it's so true. Um, I think that when you can get that sorted, the, the actual technical skills of business are not that hard and not that hard to find. Um, it's it's the it's getting the whole mindset space and realizing you know what's important and what's not. And so for this book, I really loved it. It's all about um, understanding the journey you're on and what what the ultimate gift is in life. Um, so yeah, that's two books there. Richest Man in Babylon, if you haven't read that. That's a great book. Uh, and The Ultimate Gift by Jim Stovall. Yeah, no, The Richest Man in Babylon, that's a great, 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 great book. Uh, lots of just little pearls of wisdom in that. Um, and the Ultimate Gift, Ultimate Gift, Jim Stovall. Okay, yes. that's awesome. Yeah, and you know what I love about books? Books are so powerful. There's so much knowledge in a book. And I mean, like I'm looking at The Ultimate Gift right now. You can buy it used for a dollar or for a penny plus shipping. I remember I bought Think and Grow Rich. Um, I remember I have one of my mentors. He he used to, we were in just a mastermind group and uh, one of many that I've been in. And I remember someone was like, hey, so I finished reading Think and Grow Rich. What should I read next? And he's like, well, well, do you, have you implemented it? And he's like, no. And my mentor's like, that's 20 years of research and success. Like, read it again. <laughs> you know I mean? Right? <laughs> but have, right. you buy it and I tell people about it and they don't even know it. And I'm like, I go on Amazon and I buy it for them for a penny used. And I'm like, here, here's, you know, this profound knowledge that can change your life. Um, just just get the damn book. Uh, and well, you've got a book. I've got a free. book. There's tons of knowledge there. Yeah, like Think and Grow Rich is, is free. It's out of copyright. So, you know, if you right. Google it hard enough, you can find Think and Grow Rich for free in PDF form. And, I mean, I know a whole bunch of people give it away for free. So, yeah, if you haven't read it, anyone who's listening to this, you should definitely. I, I personally love the audio version. I've got this audio version of it. I don't remember where I got it from, um, but it's it's got actually little excerpts of 
Napoleon Hill talking as well, and uh, I think it's from a seminar he gave or something. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's it's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, no, no, I love. Yeah, that sounds um, Napoleon Hill. It's fun when you get to see like the when you get to sit down for an evening and actually invite people into your mind and into your world and, and just basically download their knowledge into your brain. You know, people could buy your book, uh, they could buy my book, and they could sit down with us for an evening or two and just have us pour out our knowledge. I mean, nobody publishes a book and is like, I want to put out crap out into the world. Like, you put, you know, you put your heart and soul into that. You want to give people your best. And so it's just phenomenal. Again, Jim Rohn has another quote, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it, but it's like, you sh- yes, you should read books every evening. You should spend your nights reading Socrates and Aristotle and the thoughts of all the great thinkers of your industry and of the world. You could sit there all night and not come up with that stuff on your own. And yeah. I think that that's like, you're right. That's just brilliant. Like, um, sit there and think about like, you know, hamster dance and hamster dance and Teletubbies and <laughs> Angry Bird. Like if sitting there to my own thoughts, I sit down instead and curl it with a good book and, and put some knowledge in there. Cause you do better when you know better. So, well, to, to me, I, you know, you know, going back to kind of one of my biggest challenges is often, you know, belief and getting stuck and maybe procrastinating. And, and one of the things that I found has been the best thing to help for me when I get really super stuck uh, and my girlfriend knows this. She'll always, you know, remind me to go read a book. But basically, I, I need to go learn something. When I get really mm-hmm. stuck and I just I'm n- making no progress at all, I just need to go and learn something. So I'll go and read a book, listen to an audio book, go for a walk, um, you know, listening to Tony Robbins or something. And and that just even just five ten minutes, even if I don't finish the book, it just kind of unlocks the the blockage in my brain and then it gets me back on track. Yeah, in fact, um, two great copywriters uh, in our history, um, and one of them right now is, is the greatest living copywriter ever, um, Gary Bensavenga, and then the other one, Gene Schwartz. Um, f- great copywriters, and for those of you who don't understand the power of copy, copy is very, very, very powerful because, especially in the olden days, I mean, the history of advertising was back in the day, everyone had to sell face-to-face, one-on-one or one to a group, but when... Um, when some smart salesman realized he could take his sales pitch and write it out, that transformed his life and the world of business because now you could mail letters to people and you could you could serve a hundred thousand people in a day and you could have your best salesman like copied out on paper and mail it out uh, mail it out to whoever in the world fit your demographic and you could never have that many appointments in a day you could never scale that way it was a way to multiply themselves and their sales to can and clone their sales presentations and Gary Bensavenga and Gene Schwartz are two of the best copywriters and um, I just had a brain fart <laughs> I was so enamored with them and their history oh just you're talking about yeah <laughs> you're talking about anytime you get stuck which is funny because I just got stuck so Gene <laughs> said he never had writer's block and the same with Gary and they said that it, it, the, the solution was always more research it was just more research yeah. like just more like you know they never had writer's block because if they just really knew their subject so well execution was flawless and well not I don't want to say execution was flawless but the execution came easy they didn't have to struggle and stare at a blank page they already knew what they were putting down so what you said just fits in line with that you're you're what you said just mimics what world class copywriting you know, sales copywriters um have said both of them separately t- uh, decades apart um that you know just research if you're stuck it means that you need to do some more research and just immerse yourself in it so that's awesome um so i know we talked about the mindset stuff what is there any other mistakes you see people making when they're trying to buy a business what are like the top three mistakes someone makes when they try to buy and get into a business we had the mindset issue um so, yeah I, it's a good question so you know if you're looking to buy a business specifically uh i think one of the big mistakes is people will only look at things that they know uh, that they know about. So we're talking about, you know, for me, I don't really care. Uh, I look for a business that I can add value to, um, but I'm not necessarily too concerned about the mechanics of what industry that business is in or how it does what it does. Um, so I think, so that's a big mistake is putting on the blinkers and only looking, let's say, you know, let's say you were an electrician and you go, I'm going to buy an electrical business. In fact, I think that's probably the worst thing you could do right. because you won't buy, you won't really buy a business. You'll buy yourself a job. Right. So, um, so definitely that's a big mistake is going, this is who, this is what I do and who I am. Uh, and I'm going to buy that. And look, if, if that's what they're after, if you really just want to do your own thing, be your own boss and have your own job, then that's totally fine. But if you're serious about being a business owner, 
then one of the best things you could do is buy a business that you actually know little about the mechanics of delivery so that that way you can focus on just working on the business, being the marketer, being the the person making the decisions and the direction and the vision rather than, you know, like, for example, uh, one of my favorite examples I used to give at, at some of my seminars and I still give is a hairdresser. Like, I, I'd love to buy a hairdressing salon because there's no way any client would let me cut their hair. They'd be... <laughs> And it's perfect because it means that the most I could do in day to day would be sweeping the floor. And, um, you know, it, it, even with the gift basket business that I bought, like I, would, I thought, you know, as an IT guy, oh, there's no way that I would, I would be getting involved in wrapping baskets. But I can tell you, I know how to, to tie a really pretty <laughs> nice bow and wrap some baskets. Like come Christmas time, I can, I can do some pretty good wrapping. And while it's a pretty useful skill, I wish I didn't have it because... You know, it just when things got busy, you, you found yourself being drawn out of the, the high level stuff and into the day to day. So, yeah, definitely that's a big mistake is putting blinkers on and only looking at what you already know. Mm. Second, second big mistake is um, looking at what you can afford. Um, you know, so I had a student who literally had no money. He was a like, struggling university student. Uh, he came through my program. He, he nearly you know, put his whole life savings into doing my, my live training program. And um, so when he came through, it was like, okay, well, what are we going to do to get you into a business? And he didn't have any money, but I, he's like, oh, I should only be looking for these $1 deals and I should only be looking at these really low priced, maybe doing what we call a knowledge and skill buy-in because he had a lot of sales skills that he could get in there and get equity just for his skills. And um, it's like, yeah, we could look at that, but it's like, I want you to go and look at these businesses asking 600,000 a million dollars I want you to go in there and just start negotiating and he was he went in there um, thinking oh he's just doing it because I told him to rather than that he would mm-hmm. and he, he one in particular asking six hundred thousand uh, dollars he got right into due diligence um, you know he he figured out that he'd be able to raise money if he needed to now the deal ended up falling through and he didn't buy it but the door opened for him and if he stuck to what he thought he was going to look at, he'd probably still be sitting around going, what am I going to do? So that's another thing is don't go, well, I can only afford 20 grand. I'm only going to look at 20 grand businesses. Um, look bigger, look further out there, have the conversations because you'll be surprised at you know wh- where you'll end up. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's that's the second big mistake. And I think, I think really the third mistake when it comes to buying a business is not doing enough due diligence and getting emotionally connected. Um, it's a bit like buying a house sometimes is, you, if you get emotionally connected to the business and you go, I really want this, that's when you will make stupid mistakes. Mm-hmm. If you can, and it's easier said than done, but if you can make sure that you realize that you're doing this as an investment, that you're a business owner, you're planning on investing in this business, uh, whether it's your time or whether it's your capital, you're going to be investing in this business, you know, you've got to make sure that it ticks all the boxes. And to do that, you've got to write your rules. So, uh, you know, in my program, I spend a lot of time helping people work out their rules before they can even start looking at a business to buy because I want to save them the time of even talking to a business that doesn't meet their rules. Mm, um, so and, 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 yeah, so, you know, really, though, once you're in there and you get to the point, it's going, okay, even once you've negotiated the deal, you've put in your offer, knowing in your heart that you haven't bought the business yet, and now it's time to check all the facts, you know. So due diligence is about checking the facts. You, you, you evaluate the business and you get a whole bunch of information from the business owner. Maybe they give you some financials and things. And you, based off that, will put in your offer. But even once the offer is accepted, you now have to basically go, okay, everything they've told me could be absolutely a lie. And we now need to go and check everything they've told me and make sure it's true. Uh, before I can move forward with this deal. And and that's where people will fall down when they get too emotionally connected. They just trust. And as much as I'd love to say trust everyone in business, um, my <laughs> what I've experienced is you can't. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to, especially when you're buying a business, you've got to go, okay, cool. Everything they've told me might be true or it might be a lie. So I need proof. And then I'll only pay for what I can prove. So that's a big, big mistake too, is people get attached and they will kind of take shortcuts uh, and end up paying too much for a business that wasn't as good as they thought it was. Mm. 
Those are great tips, and I think that's really on par. Uh, that's really on point. And you can tell that you've been around the bush, and I have been around the block. And I love how you talked about not like letting your budget dictate your opportunities, because money, like money, is only one type of income. There's there's physical. Another mentor taught me that there's physical income and there's psychic income, and you know, and there's a lot of ways to to to, to cut a deal. And there's things that you don't even know. Like I know guys that talk about buying a business, and they end up only wanting a piece. Of the business, they don't even want the whole. Like, I don't want like 90% of all you got. I just want that thing, you know. I just want the customer list. I just want like whatever, and they end up just buying that. So you could walk and look at, uh, a, you know, a million dollar business, and then maybe only get something that's 200,000 or less, you know. And for anyone that seems like a lot of money, again, like it, if and and one thing I, I actually. Sorry, I'm jumping around because there's a couple of things I wanted to hit because when you were talking, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt, but I definitely wanted to highlight it. You mentioned you had someone that joined your course with like their last dollar. And I really want to ta- stop and talk about that for a second here because I think that that's, can be a dangerous thing. And it's, it's more, I think all it does in a lot of instances is perpetuate failure because it creates a scarcity mindset and situation of desperation. If you spend your last dollar thinking some guru is going to like wave a magic wand and change the situation of your life. If you if you're down to like your last dollars, the, the 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 structure, like the foundation, the infrastructure of your life, like highways, like plumbing, electricity into a house is not set up well. And you need to get a job and make some money and then go and do this and find some way to do it or go find an investor. That's not that hard. Like a lot of people think it's really difficult. It's, if you put full-time hours into trying to find an investor to give you some seed capital, you know, you can't, like, you'll get shot down a lot, but they will help you and be like, look, if you show up and you've, you know, and they like, you're like, you know, your, your plan is laughable. A lot of them, look, I've already given you half hour, hour of my time for you to show me this. Here, let me give you 10 minutes of advice. You know, and they'll point you in the right direction. And it's just like go out there and get that. And if you put full time hours into that, you can do that. And in fact, you maybe should do that if you're down to your last penny because, you know, succeeding in business, it's not business is a team sport. You know, mm-hmm. business is not something you do solo. It's not the Olympics where you show up and you, you win because you're the best shooter, you're the highest jumper. It's not that at all. It's about building teams and solving problems for large groups of people. And that's where, you know, what, uh, what Carl's been talking about is really helpful because he's talking about going out and finding people who have already built a team, who are already serving a large group of people. And you can come in and you can just step into that and not have to worry about, which is often the hardest part, just like when a rocket ship takes off to go to the moon, the hardest part is getting momentum, a train to get moving. The hardest part is that initial momentum. So if you are on your last dollar and you're listening to this call, um, you know, please don't invest that in someone's course of thinking that you're going to learn some secret that no one's revealed. There's a magic door that you're going to get brought behind and they're going to tell you the real knowledge and that's going to change your life. That's not it at all. You are on your last dollar and you need to fix it. You need to get out and hustle and either sell some stuff and get some cash under your belt first or go out and get a job or go out and get someone who will back you financially to become a partner in your endeavor and then come back and then get the education and training and then move forward when you're properly staffed. I mean, that's like going into a battle with like one arrow left. And I know everybody wants to believe like in the movies that, oh, he's got one arrow and there's three bad guys rushing at him. And oh, he kills all three of them with an arrow. But that just doesn't happen in real life. You know, like the odds of that happening in reality is just slim to none. That's why we love movies so much, because we suspend our disbelief. Um, but if you have any sort of like, you, it's a catch-22, isn't it, Carl? Because you need the training and education to get like to be successful but you can't just jump into that without anything is is that no absolutely i I, i'm and i'm glad you brought that up because yeah it's true and you know and there's times that i've seen people do that and you know they've joined my programs and i've said look i don't know if we're really in the right place should we you know maybe i should give you a refund you can you can go you know um because often you know as i said some of these people who would come to my programs with only a dollar to their name uh or if they could invest or find the money to invest in the program it was like, well, that's good. You're going to get all these skills, uh, and I can show you how to go and you know find investors and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but are you going to put in the hard work? Are you going to then do it, or are you just going to go? This has gotten too hard. It's I can't live, yeah. and you get distracted and you don't end up implementing the program. So right. my only right. flip side there would be that, you know, sometimes I do think that you know if you all you've got is some money and you you know that this education is going to be the thing that spurs you on then you know maybe you can do it but if it's going to mean that it stretches you too far that you now 
are going to get distracted by your lack of income or money, um, then it's not going to work for you. Because, yeah, you're right. Like no guru, unquote, has the magic answer and is going to give you um, a system that just instantly makes you money. And anyone who promises you that, I would be extremely skeptical of. Um, You know, it takes work. It's hard work. Uh, You know, people like Daryl and I can give you systems and we can can do things that will – you know, speed up your success and help you learn from the mistakes we've made and the successes we've made. And I think there's actually more value in our mistakes than there are our successes. But, you know, it's, if you don't implement that and you're distracted, then it's not going to work. And and that's really what comes down to you being able to implement it. And if if your lack of income is going to stop you from implementing, then there's no point in doing it. But, but I just, and yeah, and I mean, it, it, to each their own. I mean, if you think it's going to be a bit of a stretch, but that's okay because you feel, you feel like you're the type of person to rise up to a challenge and the pressure, you work well under pressure, then maybe okay. But I just, for me, I just, I'm just such a nice guy. It just upsets me because then you find someone like that and then, you know, and, and then they're in, you know, they're in trouble and you're, you know, now you're, interfe- you're like, it's interfering with your life to go out of your way to help the person. I don't mind charity by any means, but it's just, it's, you know, what I, it's just, it's, it's just, it's hard to see and deal with, and it really fr- it's frustrating. It's frustrating, and it's Absolutely. you know you, you help them the best that you can, but um, but yeah, like for me, it just it kills me when I have someone come, like that come on board, and I do have to give them a refund, send them on their way. But it, you know, like I just it, it just bothers me. I just wish that they would just be like just want them to go in the right direction and do things right. And you need to have you just need to have like you just need to have either extreme drive and passion. And then if you have that and you'll do all the, like it was either have time, knowledge or money. And, you know, and really most people have an, a, an, an excess of one of the three, they have an excess of time, they have an excess of knowledge or they have an excess of money, but they're not necessarily, you know, obviously it's not, it, it depends. It's like those uh, role playing games, right? You roll the character, you got like a seven strength and a two charisma and whatever. But I mean, if you've got a ton of time, but no knowledge and no money, then you can use that time to do the legwork, the research and all the stuff, the guys that you find to build your team with that have uh, to have money, have knowledge, they'll tell you what to do and then you go do it. You know, and the same thing if you're the guy with money, like you just got to find a way to make that work. And when people come and they just expect, it just puts a lot of pressure on the guru. And then it's like, yeah. you know, look, I appreciate your money, but I can't, I can't, I'm just want to give you your money back. And you know, here, here's a, you know, here's an hour of my time and I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. And now please just go do it and, you know, and, and get an accountability partner and, and just go. Cause it's just, I want everyone to be successful. That's why my tagline is your success is my success. I just want to make sure I got that out there. Um, but so forgive me, Carl, I took kind of a, a personal moment just to talk to the, <laughs> to the listeners, but it's because no, it's, it's, fine. it's, it's, and it's, a, it's a really good point. You know, as you say, I, I, I totally, you know, I think we had this conversation on a previous conversation between you and I privately that, you know, we get quite connected to our student success. And there are a lot of people out there that, you know, they're just about selling stuff right, right. Um, and they're not necessarily connected to getting a student to actually have results and and sometimes it's our downfall but at the same time it's better for the client and I sleep better at night knowing that I'm only taking on clients who I can actually help and I'm I'm doing my best to give them everything they need to get the results they want and I remember we had that conversation so I think it's it's really really important yeah no and that's that's again that I, I, I for people who listen to this I actually do screen I don't just look up anyone out of the phone book and invite them on to my show I these are people that I know personally and I have vetted and I would not bring them on here if I did not believe that they had your best interests at heart and so you know just please keep that in mind um, so Carl speaking of that what are you working on now what are you doing these days anyways um, I mean you've been on all sorts of uh, you've been in the news, you've been on television, you've done all sorts of stuff. What do you have going on now? Yeah, um, so I, I mean, I, I still uh, invest in and in looking to buy businesses. Uh, I've moved a lot of my focus now, unless a really good deal came along bricks and mortar, I'm these days just looking at online businesses um, because a lot of my skill set and my team skill set are in online these days. I, I'm a techie at heart, as you guys heard earlier. So. <laughs> Um, so really, I, you know, I've got a bunch of different online businesses that I've bought and, you know, I, I'm not going to, you know, say, hey, I de- tell people to, to buy businesses. I still do start some businesses as well. There's still value in doing that sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to weigh it up. But uh, so I have a bunch of different online businesses. And my, my two main focuses these days are uh, I have Business Builders Academy, which is my business education. It's really about how do I give street smart business advice to business or entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs who are passionate about business and they really see business as their serial, uh, as their life kind of 
career path, if you will. And so we're all about just giving street smart strategies uh, to help people buy a business, to build their business, or to be able to sell a business. Um, and so that's all, all education and, and online training. And then my second business is, is in automation agency, which is a done for you online marketing agency where basically a lot of these you know, products, we work with high price services, you know, coaches, consultants, uh, and we help them build what's known as like a sales funnel. Uh, and we will do all the work for them because I used to have a coaching program, a high level coaching program where I was teaching some of these uh, online marketing strategies to business owners. And what I found is that most of the time, you know, this is being connected to their results. What I found is that most of the time, three things happen. One, they would just not do anything with it, the, what they learned. Two, they would try and do it themselves, but they either weren't very techie or didn't quite grasp all the marketing nuances. So they did a really poor job. Or three, they would learn it all and go, this is great. And they'd go and find someone to implement it who would do a really crappy job. And uh, so they'd be ultimately ripped off. And, and so when I saw that, I went, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna stop doing this coaching. So I actually quit coaching. The only way people get access to me, to me personally now is through automation agency or through uh, some of my different online products where, you know, there sometimes is a coaching element. But it, I, I stopped doing any one-on-one -on -one or, or high group coaching and, and just went, you know what, my whole team who's been doing this for myself will just be available for, for those who can afford it and want it done right, and we'll just do it all through automation agency. So that's kind of my two things. I get to inspire and teach and help people be smarter in business, and those that are at the right level and, and, and need that help with the online marketing, we just do it all for them. Mm, that's awesome. and That's awesome. So if anyone listening here wants to reach out and find out more about you or ask you some questions and get in touch, what's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, best way to contact me is, you know, I'm on uh Mainly Facebook is probably my most social media that you'll find me on. Uh, I think I'm facebook.com slash Carl, C-A-R-L-D, Taylor. Uh, otherwise, go to carltaylor.com.au. Um, so that's C-A-R-L-T-A-Y-L-O-R.com or .com.au. They both go to the same place. Got it, got it, got it. All right, so that's carltaylor.com or just look them up on Facebook. Um, Carl, thank you so much for joining us on the call today. I really do appreciate your time, your friendship, your camaraderie, and uh, you sharing your knowledge and expertise and even your failures with the callers today, So, or with the callers, with the listeners today. So thank you for your time. Um, I know that the weather down there is, is awesome. We're in the middle of winter right now. I'm in California, so it's actually still great. But, um, yeah, I just hope you enjoy the sunshine for us, and just thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. It's it's sweltering hot today, and you can probably hear the fan actually in the background. If if you could call, that's what it was, the fan trying to keep me cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, enjoy the weather, buddy, and I appreciate you. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. Uh, you're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.